Hello everybody, welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and nothing like a video clip that's dedicated to fecal bacteria. Well, believe it or not, it's like really important stuff. So let me start by saying that the incidence of cancer in the colon is about 12 times higher than cancer of the small intestine. And the reason is the density of the bacteria in the colon is so much greater than it is in the small intestine. An increasingly large body of evidence is showing that negative changes in this bacteria can lead to inflammation, which then stimulates the production of carcinogenic chemicals, which then can lead to the development of cancer. One review showed that there are consistently decreased numbers of beneficial bacteria and increased levels of pathogenic bacteria in people with colon cancer. In addition to chronic inflammation, this can cause disruption of the barrier system, abnormal or depressed immune function, and hyperproliferation of cells. We call that cancer. And it can result in de decreased production of something called butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid that um, provides energy to the colonic epithelial cells, reduces inflammation, improves immune response, lowers oxidative stress, and inhibits the development of cancer. The highest concentration of butyrate is in the gut, and when levels are lower, intestinal cells start to die. So the point is that your bacteria in the colon is highly predictive of your overall state of health and your risk for colon cancer. There are significant changes in the gut microbiome as colorectal cancer develops and spreads, and testing the composition of this gut bacteria can be an effective way to screen for colon cancer. Now this has become really important lately since it's become clear that population screening with colon cancer for colon cancer with colonoscopy is very, very ineffective. In fact, it might surprise you to know that there's not a single randomized controlled trial that shows that colonoscopy reduces the risk of dying of colon cancer. As a result, the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health uh, recently updated its, rec updated its recommendations for colon cancer screening saying, quote, it does not recommend using colonoscopy as a primary screening test for colorectal cancer due to lack of evidence, end of quote. One hallmark of colorectal cancer patients is reduction in bacterial diversity. And what happens is the levels of beneficial bacteria decrease and the levels of pathogenic bacteria increase. And I'll give you some examples. And by the way, this is in the feces and the fecal bacteria that we see these changes. Streptococcus bovis, or SB, is a pathogen that enters the body through lesions in the gut mucosa, which can cause infections in humans. It's found in the gastrointestinal flora of ruminants animals like cattle and, cattle and pigs, and while there are a number of different ways it gets into the human body, one common method is through eating animal foods, particularly non-pasteurized dairy and red meat. The incidence of colorectal polyps in cancer is higher in people who have higher levels of SB or SB-related infections. Some studies have shown that the risk of developing more advanced colon cancer is higher in patients with SB-related infection too, as much as 2.5 times higher. F. nucleatum is a known pathogen, and in addition to finding it in the gastrointestinal tract, it's found in oral plaque where it contributes to periodontal disease. People who have the highest amounts of F. nucleatum in the rectal mucosa have three times higher risk of developing colorectal cancer than those who have lower levels. Salmonella enterica is another foodborne pathogen usually transmitted to humans from eating contaminated eggs and meat. While salmonella usually results in a mild infection that self-resolves, it can sometimes cause a low-grade chronic infection that really doesn't bring on any symptoms. You can have it but not know that you have it. Some studies have shown that antibody levels against salmonella are higher in colorectal cancer patients than controls and that diet is a primary cause. These observations, along with a growing body of published studies, have resulted in more research being conducted to determine the accuracy of fecal bacterial analysis for both assessing the risk of colon cancer and also for diagnosing it. In one study, researchers looked at fecal samples from 439 subjects. 203 of these people had colorectal cancer and the rest were healthy controls. Several different types of bacteria were identified in the samples. Patients with colorectal cancer had significantly higher amounts of F. nucleatum than the healthy controls. In the first cohort uh, analyzed, F. nucleatum distinguished colorectal cancer patients from controls with an accuracy rate 
of 77.7% and the ability to tell the people who didn't have cancer with an accuracy rate of 79.5%. In a second cohort, the accuracy rate was even better. It went to 92.8%. Testing based on the levels of four different bacteria reached accuracy for diagnosing colorectal cancer of 92.8% and also accuracy rate for ruling out colon cancer in patients who didn't have it, accuracy rate of 81.5%. This is a whole lot better than, than a colonoscopy screening. And it's not the only study that's shown that fecal bacteria is accurate in diagnosing colorectal cancer. And let's face it, it's a lot easier to get somebody to have their stool tested than it is to have them uh, uh, endure a colonoscopy. It's less expensive um, and, and less risky, lots of risks associated with colonoscopy. Now, I have always recommended focusing on prevention of cancer rather than screening for early detection. One of the reasons being that the screening tests are not so good, the ones that we tend to think of as the gold standard, like mammography and colonoscopy and PSA testing. But diet is one of the most powerful tools for building and maintaining a healthy colon and building and maintaining a healthy gut microbiome. For example, diets high in fiber and resistant starch. Resistant starch is a kind of fiber that's found in foods like potatoes, grains, beans. These types of uh, fiber and resistant starch stimulates the gut to produce short chain fatty acids and lactate. A few studies have actually looked at the effect of a vegan diet. You don't see very many studies that include looking at vegan diet, but, but um, uh, looking at the effect of a vegan diet on the gut microbiome and determined that adopting such a diet resulted in favorable changes to the ratio of beneficial to pathogenic bacteria, uh, particularly in the area of bacteria that can cause inflammation. On the other hand, diets low in fiber and high in fat have a detrimental effect, effect on colon health and the gut microbiome. Now, one of the most interesting experiments I've seen to prove the point and how quickly diet can make an impact was one in which researchers instructed African-American and rural African volunteers to switch diets. So what happened is the African-Americans ate a diet that was indigenous to the African rural population, and then the African population ate the high fat animal foods based diet that the average African American eats here. After only two weeks, two weeks, not 20 years, it only takes two weeks to do this, there were significant changes in the microbiome in both groups. The Africans who adopted the American diet for a while ended up having changes that were negative, uh, uh, you know, not beneficial, uh, that increased their risk of colorectal cancer, while the um, African Americans who adopted the African diet, in only two weeks, they showed improvement in their gut microbiome to reduce their risk of colon cancer. So the take home points from all of this are eating a high fiber and low fat plant-based diet promotes colon health and a healthy gut microbiome. Negative changes in the microbiome are predictive of colorectal cancer, risk for, and also can be used to diagnose. Um, testing fecal bacteria is a less expensive, less invasive, more acceptable way, and has a better accuracy rate for detecting colon cancer than uh, colonoscopy. So there are 17 references to this, I'm sorry, 20 references to this article. And if you're interested in seeing all of those, you can subscribe to the Health Rates Online Library where these are posted. Um, that does it for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you next week with more news.